Hello, and welcome to Cats Week. I'm Annalise Poorman. At the Utilities Service Board meeting on March 10th, Director of Utilities Vic Kelson gave an explanation of how the meeting is currently set up now that they are back in person. Yeah, I just wanted to share with everyone that this is not a hybrid meeting. This is an in-person meeting, but we've set up a Zoom feed because the room limit is 15 people. So with a 15 person limit, we can't have a bunch of staff in here. We can't have a bunch of visitors. And if the public comes in to speak, uh, right now we have 14 people in the room. So if two people come in, somebody will have to leave. <laughs> um, presumably one of us over here uh, will have to step outside. So um, we're going to maintain the room limit and st uh, CBU staff can join the meeting uh, externally by Zoom. I have a speaker here on my computer, so if we are in a situation where there's a staff member speaking from outside, I'll turn my speaker on so you can hear it in the room. So we do have the equipment on order to convert the room to be suitable for hybrid meetings, but there's one of the uh, critical components is uh, sh experiencing shipping delays. The last I heard it would be here mid-April, so we're gonna be doing it this week for probably a couple of months. and. Uh, uh, it's worked out fairly well, but uh, I'll make sure we have an external speaker next time. Assistant Director of Operations Tom Axum asked the board to approve an agreement with Potomac Service. I'd like to ask for your approval for a contract with Potomac Electrical Services. Uh, this is for work at the Blucher Pool Plant. It's, uh, they're going to be doing cleaning and testing on a 480-volt uh, switchgear and recondition a circuit breaker. They're also going to provide uh, two backup generators so we can keep the plant in power while they're doing their work. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Kelson also explained a memorandum of understanding with Monroe County to share the cost of a feasibility study. Uh, take uh, wastewater sludge and other solid waste streams that are organic and compostable. Uh, there's been a study done by the Solid Waste Management District and a similar discussion of, among city uh, sanitation that about 40% of the solid waste stream uh, in Monroe County is compostable. It could be digested uh, to make gas. We also, as you know, uh, handle oil and grease uh, at the Dillman plant, but we do not allow oil and grease from outside Monroe County uh, to come in because we really don't treat it. it it's in a lagoon there. Um, so. Uh, this is something we looked at a couple of years ago. We did a, an internal study looking at how much gas we could make with the waste streams that we know that we have, and including uh, uh, food waste from IU and IU Health, the new hospital, and so forth. Um, and because of the size of the digester we need to handle all the sludge from Dillman, it just didn't make sense to build something there. Uh, the other thing is that at the Dillman plant, uh, we don't have what's called primary sludge. That's the stuff that just falls out when you bring the water uh, to the wastewater plant. Uh, Dillman goes straight into aeration, so it, it doesn't have two stages of treatment. The Blucher pool plant, however, does have primary so solids, the high energy solids, and, uh, but that plant is probably too small to, di to justify an anaerobic digester all by itself. The question that uh, we're looking at, though, is to consider this as more of a, uh, not a wastewater sludge problem, but a solid waste problem. He said the study would cost about $129,000 and would be evenly split between Monroe County and the City of Bloomington. Kelson said the Solid Waste Management District Board will be discussing the study at their next meeting in April. On March 10th at the Bloomington Historic Preservation Commission meeting, the commission approved a petition to add on to a house in McDowell Gardens Historic District. Program manager Gloria Cologne presented on behalf of the petitioners, Barry Clapper and Spring Point Architects. The petitioner and the owners are requesting for an addition to the um, the house and uh, this house in McDowell Gardens. This is part of a long-term chain of projects that started with a, a garage and then with working the front facade and now the final phase, I believe this is the final phase, you can correct me, um, is the addition of, um, of a room to the side. Um, 
Uh, as staff, I originally had some concerns regarding the shape and the geometry of the building. However, um, meeting with the petitioner and the owners and seeing just how far back this addition would be um, and the fact that the McDowell Gardens Neighborhood Association supports this project and that the house is actually absolutely tiny. I've, I actually went and did a site visit and um, half the house is basically the bedroom right now. So um, the, the addition is actually barely visible from the street because this house is on a hill. Um, this area of Morton Street, the houses are, I would say about between eight and 10 feet above the ground. Um, so it's quite leveled up and then it's very, um, it's towards the back and the architecture for the, the new area, the design and the exterior are compatible with the house. And having taken all of this into careful consideration, although as staff, and I did um, as staff ask for a change in material and so I'm seeing that there is a bit of a sort of something that separates them with the paneling between the two parts. Um, this has been done with a lot of care. Uh, here's the Neighborhood Association comments. The McDowell Executive Committee is in transition at the moment, but we have a quorum in support for the proposed addition to the Pools Bungalow next to Cardinal Spirits at South Morton. We have complete faith in Barry Clapper. We love her work. Commission member Sam DeSoler said that he appreciated seeing this house again and how they have worked to establish the new additions while keeping the historic designation of the house. It's, it's been fun to watch the accretional growth of this structure at a exponential rate. It's like watching it, you know, one of those uh, fast motion films. But um, I think the petitioner has done a nice job articulating the new versus the old and uh, letting the main house still maintain uh, its, uh, I guess, primacy over both the garage and the uh, uh, the addition and it's almost becoming a, a small compound at this point uh, so I, I really uh, this one's fun thank you the board approved the addition unanimously and we'll have more cats week after this message I'm at risk of thinking there's just no point in trying. I'm at risk of looking in the mirror and hating what I see. I'm at risk of regretting what I do just to join the crowd. of being told not to tell. And you would never know it by looking at me. But with Girls Inc. in my corner, there for me every day. Believing in me. Showing me what's possible. I can be strong enough to respect myself and my body. To say I can rather than I can't. To say no with no apology. To be a leader. To finish school. To own my future. To break the cycle. Girls Inc. believes every girl can succeed. That's why the trained professionals of Girls Inc. are there for our girls every day, supporting, mentoring, and guiding them in a safe, girls-only environment building bonds that last for years and change that lasts a lifetime. Girls Inc. gives girls the tools they need to boldly face challenges, to resist peer pressure, to be the first in their families to go to college, to beat the odds. With Girls Inc. in her corner, every girl can be healthy, confident and resilient. She'll do more than dream about her potential. She'll reach it.
With you in my corner. With you in my corner? I will not be another statistic. I will fight for myself. For my future. With you in my corner, I will win. Fuel her fire and she will change the world. Girls Inc. Inspiring all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. Welcome back to Cats Week. On March 9th at the Monroe County Commissioner's Meeting, recorder Eric Schmitz presented an agreement for renewal with Computer Systems Incorporated. And the other one here is for, okay, this one's kind of interesting. Um, we accept electronic recordings and with the passage of Bill uh, 357, all counties uh, by 2024 will be required to accept any document electronically that is suitable for recording. Um, and that means, you know, assessors and auditors got on board with it and said, yeah, let's do this. Let's get it done everywhere so that it'll be universally offered in Indiana. Um, what this means for us we already accept all documents that require going through all three offices. So anything that can be recorded at all can be submitted electronically. Um, but we have, right now we have two companies that we work with to provide e-recording services. And only one of those can transfer deeds, uh, can, can electronically accept deeds. Uh, because each one has its own system. And I just didn't want to ask the assessors and auditors to learn two systems or three or four systems as we go forward and add other providers as they become certified. So what our software vendor CSI has done is to, um, they have written a, what's called a router, a document router that takes an electronic document, brings it into the recorder's office. We look at it, it gets moved on, on our server, moved on to the assessors, and then moved up to the auditor, and then it comes back down to us. It's one system that will accept all, any certified e-recording service provider so that everybody only has to know one system. And I gotta tell you, I've seen the demos three or four times now of the new system, and it looks great. And this is uh, no cost to us. The commissioners approved the perpetuation of funding. Schmitz also asked the commissioners to approve a contract with U.S. Imaging Incorporated, which will help with the digitization of county records. This involves U.S. Imaging sends a crew, and they are here scanning on site. They don't take any of our documents outside the office. Okay to stay all right here because they have to be accessible. And they'll spend about three weeks scanning all of these. And then they take it off and they start working on putting it into a format, putting the, these scanned images in together into a format where they're actual documents like multi-page documents that can be imported into our system. So that's what we've got going on here. Yeah. Right. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Commissioner Penny Giffins asked if digitizing the records would make the documents searchable with character recognition. Schmitz said that it would. At the Monroe County Council meeting on March 8th, Auditor Catherine Smith gave updates on annexation results. Um, I just want to touch base with you and see if you guys had any questions about annexation. Uh, as you know, five of the seven areas uh, pass muster on the um, number of people who uh, petitioned against it. Can you hear me now? I talk so loud. I'm always afraid I'm going to blow your ears out. Um, so anyway, so five of the seven areas passed on um, the number of people who petitioned. Six had to be exceeded. Had to exceed sixty five percent. Uh, two areas, 1A and 1B, fell between uh, the 51 and the 65%. So that determination is yet to be made. 
And I know there are people who are working on uh, possibly filing um, to uh, block the annexation through a court process. That has not happened yet. The number of days still available to do that is still in the, um, and that's 15 working days, um, still in the, uh, in the period of time that they can, they can do that. But there was two ways, and I've been asked about uh, annex, about uh, assess values. So we looked at uh, the number of people first, and then if it would not have, um, the five areas would not have uh, had enough, we would have looked at AV, uh, but they, um, they did, so we didn't have to look at the AV because it's either or. In 1A and 1B, um, it, it, it did not exceed 65% on AV or um, or on the number of people. So I kind of want to clarify that in your, um, if you had any questions about that um, and just really ask you, is there any, is there anything you want to ask me or um, I, I should acknowledge that Patrick Ellis and Chris Munch worked very, very hard and ar arduously on this project. This project was a huge project. Council member Marty Hawk said that the process of remonstration has brought community members in the county together. Um, first of all, uh, congratulations to all the people who really went out there, went door to door and just worked so hard for their neighborhoods. And um, so, I mean, I'm just grateful to see that kind of interaction here and, and uh, people meeting new neighbors that, uh, that was, if nothing else comes of this, that was a really great thing to see people working together. Um, but do we have, a, a, maybe you answered this and I wasn't understanding, uh, the timeline that, that, that if they are going to be able to come forward to um, take that to court, the, the citizens, how, what is the deadline? Time. So it's 15 working days from when I certified, and there well, seems I mean, to be about a week left, about five days left. So that's three. Okay, yes. About five. Yeah, but I didn't. I just kept. But Marty, I did want to reiterate what you said because from the end that I see, which is kind of the Switzerland end, because you know I serve both the city and you guys, and this taxpayers and pretty much everyone, just seeing the interaction from everyone coming in and filing, it. it and I've done a lot of campaigning in my life, but it was a different perspective. It was a bipartisan, um, we all hands on deck. We care, love this community. We care about my neighborhoods. I've met this neighbor. I've met that neighbor. This is the most, most interesting and most interactive I've ever been with my neighbors in my life. So it was, it was sort of kind of like the county fair where you bump into your neighbors, you say hello and, and you leave and it, it, it wasn't about the rides, it was about the experience of seeing your friends and family. So I, it, it was a really nice um, camaraderie that I saw develop amongst, not me and them, but amongst the people who, who participated. Council member Jennifer Crossley asked if the individuals in areas 1A and 1B would have to pay to file remonstration by themselves. Smith said that they would. Highway Director Lisa Ridge gave an update on road work being done in the county and requested approval of funds to be transferred to finish construction. Hawk commented saying that the roads in some areas have so many potholes that people have been damaging their vehicles. Ridge explained why the potholes are such a prevalent issue right now and how the road crews are managing them given the weather constraints. Um, actually, the plant had actually opened up what we what we use in the winter is called a cold mix and it definitely does not hold like a hot mix but that is all that is available um in the winter months for the potholes and when we get into spring the worst thing that happens is when we get the rains and then like this weekend we're going to be down to 10 degrees and we get that freeze and that's what we call a freeze thaw time and that is what's creating those potholes um uh Last week, the plant did open. They had a big paving project for another company, but they allowed us to come in for three days and uh, get hot mix. And so we used four crews a day everywhere we could to try and catch up with some of the major potholes. But it's just that freeze and thaw period right now that, that creates those. So um, hopefully within the next month, we'll be back to hot mix and, and can um, 
did the best that we can with those right now with the cold mix. The next county council meeting will be held on April 12th. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. For hurting families in Monroe County. A contribution to, to children who are vulnerable and in need of an advocate. A staff that goes above and beyond to support and advocate for children in need of services. The web of remarkable people who are dealing with difficult situations. So many young people that uh, are in need of help and try and find a stable family, a stable place to live. Without uh, the CASAs to, to make that happen, many of them would be unable to find a good home. I love being that voice for the child who can't speak for themselves in court. It takes me out of my comfort zone and it also helps others. CASA means supporting our community. Being a CASA is making sure that your village is healthy and whole and that the children in your village will someday be able to help the village as well. A child who doesn't have a voice, maybe in their family situation or a school situation, now has a voice that can advocate for them. I really enjoy working with children that are going through difficult times and letting them know that I care about their future. We are privileged with our charge of representing the best interest of children. And so therefore we can advocate for exactly what they need without restriction, focusing on their best interest. I want to repair the world one child at a time. Welcome back to Cats Week. On March 8th, the Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees held a special session to hear from Associate Director Greer Carson. Carson is a candidate for the library director's role, a position that will be vacated following the retirement of current director Marilyn Wood in May. When asked what some of the greatest opportunities are for the Monroe County Public Library, Carson said that technology has changed the way we communicate and get information. He said that the library should not only offer online platforms, but experiences. Though worthy of the reverence we share for its magic and its history, the book is no longer at the center of our world. The charge of a 21st century library is to further understand this shift, and more importantly, how it informs our community's needs and how we can continue to embrace the many opportunities for diversifying the collections and resources that we provide. We are also charged with helping our community understand and embrace this shift. Like many of our peer libraries, we've invested in this change by incorporating not only new formats, both physical and digital, but also new resources that are less about consumption of content and more about experiences and use. I like to ask questions, and this one begs the big one. What will a public library look like in the future? No one has a definitive answer, and I won't presume to offer one here. Nor is there likely to be a single answer, as each public library should reflect its own community's unique needs. But it's a question we should frequently ask ourselves, and it's an appropriate one for an age of disruption. The board will have their regularly scheduled meeting on March 23rd. At the March 7th Bloomington Redevelopment Commission meeting, Director of Housing and Neighborhood Development John Zodi asked the board to approve an increase in funding for a rehabilitation project on East Hunter Avenue. He said that they discovered foundation damage in the home while they were renovating and it exceeds the amount of money that was initially set for the project. But, so as the commissioners know, uh, periodically we've come to you um, to ask for an increase in funding for uh, rehabilitation projects for homes. Uh, the most recent ones were two mobile home projects in December where we were installing uh, HVAC units and the prices of those were higher than it originally came back. Our administrative manual, um, our, our programs and procedures document um, has a guideline in place that if there is a need for additional funds we would come to the Redevelopment Commission. Um, and there is a cap. So we have been working with the homeowner now um, to rehabilitate various aspects of his home. And it, it turns out this project, um, there are foundational, or there's the issues with the foundation, there's 
keep sort of keep finding things, uh, if you will. And so we are uh, requesting your approval to um, go above the $38,500 um, cap uh, threshold uh, and do an amount not to exceed $5,000. We have a current estimate of $2,487.27, but um, in case there are any other changes, we would not have to come back with another request. We think $5,000 is a reasonable amount to uh, proceed with that. So. Following some concerns that it could cost more than $5,000 to repair the foundation, program manager for HAND, Cody Toothman, responded about the amount of the additional fees. Uh, at least part of the work that's being done with the foundation was, I believe it was $2,800 because when we were repairing one of the basement walls, we found out there was no footer underneath. Uh, which for that to be structurally secure, it does need that footer to be poured first. Uh, and then I believe there was also some concerns in getting the front stoop area up to code, which would result in, uh, from the way it was constructed, uh, would have to also, I believe, be replaced, which was $1,200. Uh, I know. John could speak a little bit more to the way that was structured, but part of it had to do with uh, also tearing up a portion of the sidewalk as well. So uh, those two items alone were about $4,000. The commissioners approved the additional funding unanimously. Next, Director of Economic and Sustainable Development Alex Crowley presented an agreement for a sustainability consultant for the Legacy IU Health Hospital site. So, uh, you know, as we're getting ready to um, uh, prepare for the disposition of parcels for the Hopewell development, you know, the hospital site, um, we, we have uh, recognized and the mayor has, has uh, been focused on and also the, you know, the whole master planning process was um, highlighting the opportunity that exists to really uh, increase the sustainability and the sustainable development within the property um, and, and really, you know, make it uh, hopefully something that, that stands out in the community. So we uh, have uh, looked around at different opportunities and, and decided that one way to advance um, really the objective that, that the master plan and all of the prepare here is to, to have a uh, third party, in this case, Guy Dunn, come and really help us in a couple of different respects to prepare for the disposition of, disposition of the property. So the first is to do some advanced due diligence work, uh, due diligence work in terms of understanding how other communities have, um, you know, sort of entered this phase and really led up to a successful sustainable development outcome. Um, the second is to um, help us through a workshop, really educate the team on a couple of uh, important aspects that due diligence work, but also the financial impacts of um, different scenarios having to do with sustainable, sustainable development. So to, to help us understand some of the, you know, financial implications of the kinds of outcomes that we're seeking. The board approved the resolution unanimously. And that is all for Cats Week. Thank you for joining us. For Cats and WFHB, I'm Annalise Poorman.